Today we are continuing our study in the book of Romans. And I want to invite you to turn with me to Romans chapter 11. And we're going to start reading in just a moment from verse 13. Romans chapter 11, starting to read from verse 13. But before we do that, I want us to remember something of where we've been. My question this morning is, what is God doing? Have you ever wondered that? When I was a little boy, I used to accompany my father to the workshop. And very often he would be on his bench working and I would say, Dad, what are you doing? And he would explain it to me. This morning, I was sitting at the table and uh, I looked at my wife and she was busily preparing something on the stove. And I said, Honey, what are you doing? And she shared with me what she was doing. And guess what? When we ask God the question, what are you doing? Very often, through the scripture, he lets us know what he is doing. And today, I want you to think about what God is doing. Paul is building off of what he said in verse 12. He said in verse 12, and I quote, But if there, and I want to stop right there and say that the word there, T-H-E-I-R, is referring to Israel. Okay? But if there, Israel's transgression means riches for the world, and there, Israel's loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will there, Israel's full inclusion, bring? In other words, right now Israel is going through a low time, through a loss. But eventually God has promised that Israel will come into full inclusion and at that point it's going to be wonderful. So Paul wants to share more about what God is doing in answer to the question or in explanation of the verse that we, we just read. So we want to continue reading at verse 13. The Lord is speaking through Paul and he says this, I am talking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I take pride in my ministry in hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, through a wild, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing sap of the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted. But they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you will also be cut off. 
And if you do not, pers uh, sorry, and if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in. For God is able to graft, graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature, and, the, and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this uh, word from you through the Apostle Paul. And we pray that you will help us to understand it and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, we're asking the question, what is God doing? And again, we need to reflect on what the situation was in Rome. In Rome, there were two kinds of Christians. There were the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. The Jewish Christians thought they were better than the Gentile Christians because of their heritage. And Paul has challenged them and say, said to them, your heritage didn't bring you to God. Your faith in Jesus Christ did. And now he is talking to the Gentile Christians. And the Gentile Christians said, well, the large majority of the Jewish people didn't accept Jesus as their Savior. So God has, has put the Jewish people to the side and has accepted the Gentile people. So we are better than the Jews. So each one is saying, playing that silly little game that some of us played in school. I'm the king of the castle. You're the dirty rascal. <laughs> And the Jews were doing it to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles were doing it to, to the Jews, and they were Christians, folks. And Paul was fed up with this nonsense in the church. Believe it or not, there's that kind of nonsense among Christian people today. We're prejudiced against each other, and we think we're better than somebody else. It's not true, folks. We are only here by the grace of God. And if we think we are better than somebody else, that means that something we do or we have done makes us better. And there is nothing that we do or have done that makes us better. It's only the blood of Jesus that makes us better. And that doesn't make us better than anybody else. It make, makes us better than our sins. So Paul is sharing this with his people, or the people in Rome. And in verses 13 to 16, Paul shared his hope for his own people, Israel. He was addressing the Gentiles. He starts by saying, I am talking to you Gentiles. And he took pride in his ministry. Paul was a Jew, and God had given Paul a very special responsibility. He was supposed to be the apostle or the sent one to the Gentile people. And he said, I am doing my job as an apostle to the Gentile for a purpose. He says, I take pride in my ministry, the last part of verse 13, in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. Paul said, I'm passionate about reaching Gentiles, people who are not Jews, for the gospel. I'm out there being a missionary every day, all the time. And the reason that I'm out there being a missionary all the time and I'm so passionate about it is because I hope that through my passion to reach Gentile people for the gospel, some of the Jewish people who should believe the gospel will get envious and say, wow, if Gentiles believe in Jesus Christ, I want to do it too. And then Paul says, that's my goal. 
to get my own people to believe in the gospel. So he hoped to save them through envy. And he uses three illustrations. The first illustration he used was an illustration about fruit. And uh, that we find, uh, let's see, their rejection of the Messiah brought reconciliation to the world. Verse 15. Their rejection brought reconciliation to the world. Who was the ones who, who rejected the Messiah? The Jews had. And their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, but then, then he flipped it over and he said, what will their acceptance of the Messiah do? It will be like life from the dead. Now you say, what is Paul thinking of when he talks about life from the dead? Well, if you skip down to verse 23, he unpacks it a little bit. And we'll get there eventually, but I just want to read it for you. He says, if they do not pers if they, that is the Jewish people, do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. Paul is going to talk about branches that are cut off from a tree and then left for a while. And I ask you the question, what happens to branches that are left on the ground for a while? They die. And Paul says, God is able to take a branch that is left on the ground to die for a while, and he is able to take that branch and graft it into a tree and still make it come back to life. I couldn't do that. <laughs> But God can. And when God puts Israel to the side for a few thousand years by our time, by two days, by God's time, if you think of a thousand years being a day, well, God can put that branch to the side for a while and he can give that branch life and that life is life from the dead. So, Paul is using the illustration of good fruit and better fruit. From the rejection of the Messiah, the, from the Jewish rejection of the Messiah, God brought life to the Gentiles. From the Jewish acceptance of the Messiah, God will bring, bring even greater life to both Jew and Gentile. It will be like life from the dead. Then he gives a second illustration, and this is an illustration for a baker. The first one was for a farmer. This one's for a baker. He says if part of the dough is holy, then the whole batch is holy. This is the concept in the Old Testament of first fruits. They would take something small, for example, if they would have grain, they would have a huge uh, coming in of, of grain at the harvest time, and they would take just a sample of that grain and give it to the Lord as an offering to thank Him. That was the best part, the first part. They would give it to the Lord. By the way, that's where we got the idea of tithing from. We give the best part, the first part of our money to the Lord as a thank you offering? This, they would bring the first part of their grain, or in this case, the first little lump of the dough. It's kind of like one of those donut holes. You know? First little lump of dough, they would offer that to God, and that little lump of dough became holy. And he said, if that little lump of dough became holy, then the whole lump of dough, the whole uh, rest of the dough, the whole batch, would become holy. And Paul is using this as an illustration of Israel and the Gentile people. 
If God saves Israel from their evil backsliding and disobedience, they will become holy. And if that little Israel is holy, then the rest of the world will become holy too. The rest of the world who believes in Jesus. So he talks about, first of all, the good fruit and better fruit. Second, the part and the whole. And then he gets to the root and the branches. He said, if the root of a tree is holy, then the branches are holy too. And do you know what the, who he says the root of the tree is? Jesus Christ. Jesus is the root of the tree, and Jesus is holy, and because the root of the tree is holy, the branches are holy too. So Paul shares with the Gentiles the fact that he has a passion to see the Jewish people come to faith again in Jesus Christ. They had the opportunity before, but they rejected him. But now he still has the hope that through the Gentile church, the Jews will still become Christians. That's why I have invited uh, the Jews for Jesus to come and share their ministry with us in the past. They are actively sharing their faith in Jesus with other Jewish people. And we should be praying for them and supporting them in their ministry. So, for, first of all, Paul shared his hope for his own people, Israel, verse 13 to 16. Then, secondly, Paul issues a warning to us Gentiles. Look at verses 17 to 21. He wanted us to avoid the Jewish problem of pride. Anybody have a problem with pride? Did you know that the word sin, the middle letter of the word sin, is I? The middle letter of the word pride is I. And when I am more concerned about myself than I am about anybody else, then I have a problem with pride and pride is sin. Paul says, do not consider yourselves superior to the other branches. Oh, I'm a wild olive, olive branch, but look, the real olive branch ended up on the floor. It's not important. And I'm grafted into the tree. I'm more important than them. Ba -da 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 -da. And that's how we as Christians can sometimes feel. We're better than other people. And Paul says, don't think that way. Do not consider yourself to be superior to the other branches. You say that some branches were broken off, and they were. Why were they broken off? They were broken off because of unbelief. And I want you to understand this. The Christian faith does not mean that we believe at one point in time and then we can stop believing and be sure of heaven. That's not what it means. It means that we begin believing at one point in time and we continue believing for the rest of our lives. And Paul says that what their problem was, was Israel did not believe in the Messiah. But he says, if you think you are better than them, that means you think that you can do something to get yourself right with God. And if you think that you can do something to get yourself right with God, then you are fooling yourself because the only way that you can get right with God is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's nothing that you did. So he says some branches were broken off. Yes, because of unbelief. Wild olive shoots were grafted in. Yes, that is true. 
but that you are only grafted in how? By faith. That's the only way. You share the sap of the olive root. You have life from Christ only because you believed in him, in his life and death and resurrection. Paul says, if you do consider yourself superior, think about this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. In other words, you didn't do anything for Jesus in order to get saved. Oh, isn't Jesus so lucky that I got saved? He got this wonderful preacher. Isn't Jesus so lucky that I got saved? He got this billionaire and I can give money to the church. Isn't Jesus false stock right now? You didn't do anything to get saved. The only thing that happened for you to get saved was you believed in what Jesus did for you. That's the only thing. You do not support Jesus. Jesus supports you. You are like an olive tree. You do not support the roots. The roots support you. He said, well, you will say, I was, branches were broken off so that I could come in. And Paul says, that's true. But remember, you, they were broken off for one reason, and that was unbelief. And you stand by faith, and it's the only way you stand in Jesus Christ. And if you do not believe in Jesus Christ, you are not a Christian. That's it. Do not be arrogant, therefore, but tremble. Do you realize that when we stand before a holy God, even though the blood of Jesus has cleansed us from our sin, the holy God is still awesome. And we tremble before him because we're just finite human beings. Do not be arrogant, Paul says. If God did not spare the natural branches, if God did not spare the people of Israel who came into unbelief, do you think God will spare you if you're a person of unbelief? And the answer is no. He will not spare you either. So, in verses 13 to 16, Paul shares his hope for his own people, Israel. In verses 17 to 21, Paul issues this warning about pride to the Gentiles. And then in verse 22 to 24, Paul explains the actions of God. Now we're getting to the answer to the question, what is God doing? Paul says, consider the kindness and sternness of God. If I told you that Jesus loves me, would you think that oh, that was a surprise or something new? No. We've heard it since we were kids, many of us. Jesus loves me. If you heard that God hates sin, which news do you like better? Jesus loves me or God hates sin? Think about it. They're not, one is not more true than the other. They are both equally true. God is kind and God is stern at the same time. In the children's story, uh, Chronicles of Narnia, there's a little place where they, the children are talking about Aslan 
And then one of the children says, Aslan, this big lion that's a symbol of God, the, one of the children says, is Aslan the lion safe? And the guy says, no, he's not safe, but he is good. God is not safe. We cannot tame God down to our size. God is stern against evil, but at the same time, God is good and God is kind. So Paul says, consider the kindness and the sternness of God, like two sides of a coin. God's sternness was shown to those who fell, and where did they fall? Into unbelief. If God knows that you are a person of unbelief, he will be stern towards you. On the other hand, God's kindness is shown to those who, and get this word, continue in it. What is that? Continue in believing. When I become a Christian, I don't believe Jesus just one day and then forget about it. When I become a Christian, I believe in such a way that I continue believing for the rest of my life. That's true faith. And Jesus' kindness and his love is poured out on people who continue believing for the rest of their lives. God's sternness was shown to those who fell. God's kindness is shown to those who continue in it. An alternative to continuance is, if you do not continue in his kindness, Paul says, you also will be cut off. I don't believe in Jesus anymore. Well, I have news for you. Then you didn't really believe him in the first. And you'll be cut off. But then he says it positively. If they do not persist in unbelief, the people of Israel are in unbelief, and Paul believes that their unbelief is temporary. He says if they do not continue in unbelief, they will be grafted back in again. There's hope for my people Israel because they don't have to persist in unbelief. You might know a person you might have an, even have a family member who, as far as you know yet, has told you that they don't believe in God. Can I tell you a secret? That's not the end of the story. God can change their heart, and they don't have to continue in unbelief. They have stayed in unbelief. They have maybe unbelief, had unbelief for a period of time, but they don't have to continue in unbelief. And they, if they stop their unbelief and start believing, God will have kindness and mercy and love on them. There's always hope. As long as there's breath in our lungs, there's hope for a change. And Paul says if they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in again because God is able to raise the dead. Wow. And did he prove it? Yes, he proved it by raising his own son from the dead. Jesus Christ is alive. And because God can raise Jesus from the dead, God can raise an unbeliever from the dead unbelief into the living belief in Jesus Christ. And some of you watching need to, need to be raised from the dead of your unbelief and need to be raised into the belief in Jesus Christ. And that can happen to you even today. So Paul says God is able to do this. And then he uses the illustration of a wild and a cultivated olive tree. 
The Gentiles were cut, cut out of a wild olive tree. That means it grew naturally. But the Jews were cultivated out of, uh, or were taken out of a cultivated, or deliberately planted and cared for olive tree. He says, the Gentiles were cut out, out of a wild olive tree, and you were grafted, a branch of you was grafted into the cultivated olive tree. And on the other hand, Israel was part of the natural branches, but they were, some of them were cut off because they were not bearing fruit. They were not believing. And he says, it's amazing. God did a miracle when he took a wild olive branch and put it into a cultivated olive tree. And if God can do that for the Gentiles, don't you think that God can take a natural olive branch and get that into the natural tree that it came from? It's a perfect fit. Yes, he can do that. So, we conclude with this question. What is God doing? And my answer to you is, God is gardening. God is gardening. He is at work to develop a fruitful olive tree. He is using both the cultivated and the wild olive branches. And he is working on the Gentiles and he is working on the Jews at the same time to develop in him in Christ, the perfect olive tree that he wants to develop. He loves the whole world. And that means he loves you. And he loves me. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you love us. And that you have decided to reach the Gentiles for the gospel. We pray that you would work in our lives and help us to be sensitive to your call. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody watching or listening, that they would come to know you as their Savior and Lord. If there's anyone here that needs to know that you are their Savior, I pray that that will happen today. And I pray that you will help us to understand what you are doing. You are working miracles in our lives to produce the olive tree that you want to grow. With Christ as the root. You want to show your love for your son Jesus by making a huge olive tree from what he did on the cross of Calvary for us. Help us to be joyful joiners, <laughs> joyful additions to your wonderful olive tree. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.